Once one has become a psychic citizen of Atlantis by passing the Contributors Club ritual, they may choose to pursue additional rank in Atlantis, which makes them eligible for holding office in its government or church banks. There are three such extra rank rituals, and they are collectively called Egyptian Masonry, due to the plot of the drama they describe. The first of these rituals is hosted in the Water Lodge, whose bricks are orange on blue mortar, and whose symbol is the blue isosahedron. The moral of the ritual is to explain that some of the written records of history are not factual. Introducing the psychic student to this concept slowly, the guide explains the meaning of the Courier's Guild ritual to teach the student to be able to clearly discern right and truth from wrong and lies. The student lies down in the middle of the darkened vault. Gradually, dawn rises and they see they are lying in a sea of sand surrounded by dunes for miles on all sides. From the direction of the sunrise, Imhotep approaches. He stops at the head of the candidate, thinking aloud about his mission as vizier for the three kings. In order to build the three massive tombs, the Egyptian pharaohs envisioned, they have commissioned Imhotep to resurrect a massive workforce from the dead. Imhotep stands at the candidate's head and magically summons Nyarlathotep, the ghost of an ancient sorcerer who knew the ways of necromancy. Nyarlathotep, after explaining how he plans to do so, reluctantly agrees to serve Imhotep their pact is that, while Narlehotep walks alive raising the dead, Imhotep will take the elder wizard's place in hell. Then the lights come on, and the second initiation ritual is complete. The Grip of Narlehotep Instruction As in the first degrees ceremony, the candidate is first given the knowledge lecture accompanied by a brief introduction to the initiation ritual, delivered by their guide or first initiator, who subsequently does not participate in the rite proper. The introduction lecture explains the origin of the rite in prehistoric antiquity, introduces the characters of the rite and gives a brief synopsis of what occurs in the rite. Following this, the guide asks the candidate if they have any questions, and then the guide leads the candidate into the vault. Guide You have chosen to pursue the mysteries of Imhotep, to learn about Atlantean masonry. But are you prepared to restore it? This is a solemn truth you must prove yourself. To enter paradise all one must do is choose not to bring about the ends of mischief and chaos. If you do not follow the urge to destroy yourself and be resurrected in a more perfect world, you would not exist at all. But we exist to build up not tear down. You must work to restore the Atlantean tradition of fair justice and democratic ideals to reality. You must go out and tell all your friends to tell all their friends the right way to achieve transcendence, though this right way will be different for each of them. How then can we spread the word about the good work of restoring Atlantean masonry? If we perfect ourselves, those who come to us will already understand and want to know more naturally. That is the subject of this ritual. In order to build the pyramids, our order recounts. Imhotep recruited the black magician, Nyarlahotep. Nyarlahotep then raised up workers from the dead in this way, you will learn how to activate your naturally negative-oriented chi, or quanta of karma, and make them switch on positively. 
therefore, during this rite, you are asked to meditate upon the level plane by day and the completed pyramids by night. This is to remind you of the underworld, where tomorrow is perpetually being built. Instruction Once the candidate confirms their understanding of this, the guide escorts the candidate into the vault. The 2A degree ritual begins in the same position as the 1 degree ritual, with the candidate lying face up, flat down, in the middle of the floor of the pitch black vault. Voice over. Before the beginning there was nothing. A vast empty void there was not. Nor was there a deep shadowy abyss. Nor even a pitch black vaulted tomb. There was simply nothing. And that was all that existed. This was before time began. Nothingness filled all the highest heavens and flooded right up to the feet of God. It moved across his face. He breathed nothingness in. Had it been like water, he might have drowned. But water had not been created yet. Instead, it was nothingness. Instruction the lights in the vault begin to fade up slowly from the direction of the candidate's head, representing dawn. Voice over. Then God uttered the universe, or one sequence of letter vibrations. This word became the highest heavens, and God reached out his right and left arms through the heavens leaving hosts of angels in their wake. He reached out into the nothingness below, and it became solid in his wake. From the nothingness, God shaped, formed, molded, and made our world paradise. The nothingness that God shaved, sculpted, carved and cast away, fell and became material reality. Instruction From the direction of the candidate's feet, a large, shadowy object is moving as if it is alive. It resembles a very large octopus, however with an unidentifiable number of tentacles. Voice over we are told that when God first formed man, one of the angels of his making rebelled against God. This angel, who sat on the right-hand side of God, was damned to fall with the negative matter. It is said many angels sided with this rebel, who also tempted Adam and Eve into exile from paradise. In the digital world of fallen matter, some things appear to change, while others do not. Things change at varied paces, and all will change with greater rapidity until everything is utter chaos. This is the key of Atlantean masonry. May you remember it to the grave. This is the grip of Nyarlahotep. Instruction. The lights in the vault suddenly all begin strobing at varied irregular rates. The great, shadowy beast rushes up to the candidate with its tentacles reaching out to grab them. Suddenly, a large yellow light representing the sun breaks across the black horizon in the direction of the candidate's head. The shadowy chaos beast lets out a blood-curdling wail and disappears in a sudden explosion of foul-smelling smoke. From the direction of the candidate's head, a figure approaches, silhouetted in front of the rising sun. He is the source of the voiceover. Voiceover If Nyarlahotep grips your hand, you will surely be a corpse, for to feel his grip 
is to touch the timeless nothingness. Nyarlahotep was once a black magician. He chose to fall into the temptations of the rebel angel. He turned away from the one true god and made blood sacrifice to the damned pantheons. He fell into an ecstasy and he entered the realm of the underworld. In this state, Nyarlahotep discovered a terrifying secret. He learned the desert lands west of the Nile were lush and fertile once. It was reduced to silt by the world flood. In the deepest dunes of this desert now rest the corpses of drowned Atlanteans. Then Nyarlahotep was shown the way to raise the dead from the desert. When he returned from the netherworld, the infinite zero of the nothingness, he immediately repented and went to live in the desert. It is said by Bedouins they have seen him squatting in the desert eating dust. The pact Nyarlahotep made with the Dark Lord rendered him a chaos beast, ghost monster of nightmares. It is to Nyarlahotep that I, Imhotep, vizier of the three kings, Cheops, Kephren, and Menkare, go to make a pact with him, to give my soul to travel the underworld in place of his own, in exchange for him raising a courier's guild of dead slaves from the desert, all to be stamped with the sole goal of building three great tombs. It is I, Imhotep, who now awakens to dawn in the dune sea from dreaming slumbers of nothingness, haunted by Nyarlahotep. He is near. Instruction. From the direction of the candidate's feet, a hooded figure approaches. In the brighter light of later dawn, the candidate can better see the hooded Nyarlahotep. He is all swaddled in rags, so that his body and limbs are entirely concealed. The gauze wrapped around his skin is seeping blood. Nyarlahotep limps up. From the direction behind the candidate's head, Imhotep draws into view as well. Nyarlahotep stands at the candidate's feet, and Imhotep stands at the candidate's head. Imhotep. O oh, wise Nyarlahotep, I know that you can read my thoughts. I understand you know my intentions already. Nyarlahotep. Understand my wisdom. O oh, wise Nyarlahotep, I call you now to labor, and by doing so, to serve the one true God. Nyarlahotep. O oh, foolish Imhotep, what future do you imagine you foresee? Where shall our names be carved on the tombs for others we are to build? Who shall remember the workers once the work is done? Will you guide them back to heaven once you have been sent to hell? Imhotep I am called the scribe. Let me pass once through the underworld now and then return to oversee building on the tombs. I will record all that I observe beyond death and leave it to my son, Tahotep. He will thus instruct the workers. Nyarlahotep I am called the Chaos Beast and dweller on the threshold. Do you think you can stand my awful judgment for me, under the scrutiny of the Most High's all-seeing eye itself, until the mortal ends of evil and the final judgment of the material reality? For to answer the call of Cthulhu you must now. 
to the twin-headed Satan and Moloch. You must pledge to be forever indebted. You must become the chaos beast that I, Nyarlahotep, now am. Imhotep, O oh, mighty master of your own fate, my destiny is in the hands of the righteous Most High as much now as forever. I will bear your burden, but I am judged only by the one true God. That is my right. Nyarlahotep, then you are duly and truly prepared. Imhotep, I am. Now, Nyarlahotep, grip my hand to bind our pact. Instruction. Imhotep reaches out to Nyarlahotep, but Nyarlahotep extends a bandaged appendage to the candidate. Nyarlahotep to candidate. Know my grip as you shall know a man by his deeds. Instruction. Nyarlahotep seizes the candidate and drags them to their feet. As soon as the candidate is standing, Nyarlahotep vanishes through a concealed trap door, leaving only his outermost robes behind. Imhotep steps up to these and parts them with his foot to reveal a bloody knot of tentacles surrounding a single, milky eye. Then Imhotep turns to the candidate and grabs their hand in his. Imhotep, to Candidate. No more is Nyarlahotep the Chaos Beast. Now I summon Osiris, his immortal soul, into this raised corpse. For your soul's name to live forever, I shall write the book of Coming Forth into Day, and the book of what is in the Amduat, the way of the dead, the river Styx. Though all the many dead you shall raise shall each be branded by your own unique soul, Osiris, sigil of your aura, they will all die only one death, your own, and then you shall be called the king of the underworld and lord of the dead. The slaves and my seed shall follow in our names the same way through the afterlife, and we shall become known as great gods, even alike yad heh and Elohim. They will always remember Thoth, soul of Imhotep, and Osiris, soul of Nyarlahotep. Now is the dawn arisen on this first day of the resurrected dead. Let the righteous Most High judge our deeds on this day without error, and may his good mercy mark our names down for all times as his servants. You shall go forth to raise more dead now, but I must journey now into the timeless nothingness of the underworld. Go now, Lord Osiris, soul of Nyarlahotep, reach into the desert sands as God reached into the nothingness and raised the dead by calling the bodies of the dead Anunnaki to return to the labor of Atlantean masonry you shall earn the restoration of your soul and redeem this body which belonged to Satan himself you shall give these all your soul and my son Tahotep will elevate them to democracy you go to restore Atlantis now, and I, Imhotep, shall journey through the underworld. When I return, Tahotep shall show you my ways, and then you shall lead the workers through transcendence into paradise. For now we part ways, Osiris resurrected Lord of the Dead. Our destinies are already set in stone in the highest heavens above, behind the skies. Go. Instruction. 
While Imhotep has been speaking, the candidate's initial initiator, the guide, has been sneaking up on the candidate from behind. As Imhotep finishes speaking and turns his back to them, the guide takes the candidate's arm and, turning them around abruptly, escorts them arm in arm from the vault. Guide. So you see that it is because of Imhotep's pact with Nyarlahotep that workers were raised to restore Atlantean masonry after the flood. This is symbolic of how each of us now must work to restore our own fallen souls. We therefore turn to studying the Tree of Life, which is like a blueprint of our finished work. Our DNA is the gross matter of our work, and the alignment of the chakras, the tool we use to work upon our DNA. By perfecting our work in this way, we cleanse our aura and our soul transcends. Therefore, we call the art of perfecting our craft, raising the dead. This refers to the transformation of our exterior environment by aligning the chakras to cause our DNA to obey the will of our brains. When our chakras align through the study of the tree of life, our external environment will be calm and serene, a still reflection of our internal composure, our DNA doing the will of our brain through its control of our nervous system. This is how our spirits, when called to labor, do good work to cleanse the chi karma in our aura. We raise the dead, nerves usually unused in our brains, to activate our junk DNA. This causes the DNA to transmit the will of the mind directly into the clephotic quanta of our surrounding environment. When we accomplish this, we transcend the lower material world and perceive a higher spiritual world beyond. Instruction. By now, the guide escorts the candidate to the door of the vault and outside into the antechamber. Here they ask the candidate if they have any questions and if they fully understand. If they understand, they are considered past and have graduated from labor. The first title is Union. Yoga means union and karma means labor. Just as consciousness calls us to labor, the work of perfecting our karma, so is union symbolic of the alignment of the chakras and cleansing of the aura that is the goal of karmic work. So we can refer to the work of perfecting our karma as labor, and we can refer to the goal of this labor, the perfection of our karma, as yoga or union. The work of aligning the seven chakras of the spine is one kind of yoga. The work of cleansing the aura externally surrounding each of us is another. This is why the words labor, and union also have different meanings. We can refer to our inner work of aligning the chakras via an external symbol, such as the cube stone or perfect ashlar. Likewise, the term union, referring to outer effects of our inner alignments, we can symbolize as a group of workers, the chakras, all working together, aligned, toward the same goal, the cleansing of the aura. In order to achieve external yoga, we must first accomplish internal alignment of the seven chakras of the spine. In the same way, RNA unzips the double helix of DNA 
during cellular replication. The seven chakras are the nerve centers along the spine that deliver the commands from the brain into the gross tissues of the body. The work of aligning these seven chakras is called kundalini yoga. Kundalini represents the interior upward spiral portion of the toroid energy field of which the aura is the exterior hypersphere. Kundalini is the inner soul or spark of life. After the inner chakras are aligned and the kundalini rises and descends throughout the nervous system unimpeded by retained stress and a desire to distraction, the aura can begin to be cleansed and the external environment itself around the entity will begin to change. This can only occur when the higher external and lesser interior will are aligned both within and around a being. The digital units of change in our surrounding environment are called chi or units of karma and they collectively comprise our aura. We say the aura of a being is cleansed when the being does the good work of perfecting themselves and does this for the right reasons. When such an alignment is achieved, we say the person has completed the great work of karma yoga. They have achieved a condition of labor union. At this point they are, if still alive, automatically members of the order of death. The union among the living and the dead who help others to achieve the great work of labor union. The original founders of this order were the Quarriers Guild of Builders on the Three Great Pyramids. They studied all these types of metaphysics, and it is from them we learn the measure of the Kundalini spiral within the toroid is called Phi, and that the exterior aura's measurement is, likewise, pi. The second title is Boaz. Boaz is the name given to the southern pillar on the east gateway into the inner temple of the first temple called the Temple of Solomon. Any Freemason can tell you that. But what we are studying delves beyond this. What we study is perfect Atlantean masonry. Some Freemasons might try to tell you the pillar of Boaz on Solomon's temple was hollow and that it contained many treasures of the original craft masonry. Do not ask such a Mason to recite Boaz's inner inventory to you, however. They will not be able to do it. These, they will tell you instead, are the so-called lost keys of masonry. But you must not bother to ask them what was inside Boaz. Instead, you must enlighten them on the true origins of the southern pillar on the eastern gateway to the temple. Instruct such a mason on the true Shemham Farash not the 72 names of the angels of Exodus, based on the 36 Egyptian civic calendar deacons, nor on the Goetia of Solomon, based on these 72 angels being used as workers on the first temple. All that, explained to them, is only an allegory for the building of the Egyptian pyramids, followed by the rebellion of the slaves, that led to the exodus to begin with. Even the pyramids of Egypt, you may explain to them, were only a repetition of a practice remembered from before the world flood that destroyed Atlantis. Thus we study Solomon to learn the fate of the workers, 
but we study Egypt to study the craft of the builders. By studying the Apocrypha, books excluded from but belonging in the tradition of the Bible, we can study the historical origins for the builders' practice of safe housing their tools inside the pillars of their craft. In the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jasher, the three stele of Shem, on the eighth and the ninth, and Plato's Republic, we find recounted an occult history of this secret craft. Before the flood, before even the birth of Noah, Noah's great-grandfather, Enoch, had a prophetic dream. Enoch commissioned all the knowledge of the universe, inscribed on two pillars, to be buried with him in a tomb nine chambers deep in a secret place. He then instructed his son to give Noah a third stone tablet containing directions to this tomb to survive the flood. Abraham came to inherit Noah's stone tablet, and he took it with him from Ur into Egypt. There, in the catacombs beneath Giza, he secreted it away, the twin pillars of Enoch, and built the pyramids over them, leaving the third key buried beneath the paw of the Sphinx. Moses, also called Akhenaten, then led the enslaved builders of the pyramids out of captivity into Canaan. Solomon then built the first temple to house in its sanctum sanctorium the third keystone. Then Menelech, son of Solomon and the queen of Sheba, stole the stone from within the ark. The remains of the original builders were buried on the shore of the Dead Sea, where they were later discovered by the Essenes, the exiled priests of King David, during the Roman captivity. Their writings, leading to the location of the Ark, were eventually found by the Knights Templar during the Crusades. But the Templars could not enter Egypt, and it was not until Napoleon that the pyramids could be excavated. Around this time, Neo-Jacobinism took hold in America, and the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry was created. From this source, we learn about the lost keys of masonry, represented by the twin pillars of the eastern entrance to the first temple. But, as you can see now, the true order, the Atlantean Masons, knew much, much more than anyone since the time of the Flood. This order is the modern inheritor to the mysteries of Imhotep and the mastery of Atlantean masonry. All ye who seek knowledge over geometry, let them enter here, and let all you who are able to understand and who can apply, let them calculate the numbers of their own name for they are among the numbers of the builders of the great pyramids, the first and second temples, and they are brothers in our great order. All of us stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before. In this way we finish our good work, align our chakras to cleanse our auras, and transcend from the cares of the mundane world. The third title is Bariah. The name for the mundane world, used among those who have transcended its dull cares, who have graduated from labor and become members in our order, is Asaya. The realm above and beyond the mundane world of Asaya is that with which the order teaches union. This realm, although the lowest of God's highest heavens, is considered paradise and associated with the state of grace possessed in the Garden of Eden before the fall. 
this realm above the mundane world of Isaiah, the realm of Eden, is called Bariah. How do we achieve transcendental union with Bariah? Some say only through Christ can original sin be forgiven. Others believe anyone righteous in Allah shall enjoy the fruits of paradise. Both agree such can only be achieved either in the afterlife or in an impossible utopia. Thus, those who believe in Atlantis and those who believe in Eden can both agree that so long as mankind exists in the fallen world of Isaiah, the mundane world of matter and action, of cause and effect, and the lesser will, then Bariah, the world above, remains divided from and beyond us, representing a perfect world infinitely better than the here and now. However, what does this mean to say man is fallen, or that this material reality is inferior to the realms we can presently only imagine? We say that part of man's fall separated Isaiah from Bariah by the interjection of a third world called Yetzirah. According to legend, Bariah was Eden, but Yetzirah, the splendor of the emanations, shattered the vessels of Bariah into the shards of the shells, the cliffotic quanta that comprise Isaiah the material universe. Thus we say that, before the fall, Bariah existed and mankind dwelt in paradise. As the fall happened, the world of Yetzirah passed through the world of Bariah and destroyed mankind's place in it. Thus, after the fall, man dwells in Isaiah, the earthly or material world. But that transcendence to Bariah is still possible. How is this to be accomplished? How does one align the chakras and cleanse the aura? It is by studying the tree of life and thus restoring the shattered shells and raising up through Yetzirah away to the arisen Bariah. Thus, when we describe Bariah, we mean the kingdom to come, the once and future world of perfection. However, to cleanse the aura and achieve Bariah, we must first align the chakras by studying the tree of life. Otherwise, we might achieve but cannot attain. We can reach, but not grasp, hold, and climb. The fourth title is Formation. Yet Syrah is the realm of formation now, after the fall. However, in truth, Yet Syrah is the realm of divine creation, and Bariah, the lesser realm, the realm of the formation of Adam in Eden. To align the chakras, we study the tree of life. The seven inferior or lesser sephirot on the tree are equivalent to the seven chakras of our present evolution. The three supernal or crown sephirot refer to the exterior aura of which the seven chakras are the interior spiral. Thus, we use the tree of life as a model for the interior chakras that we can make and form outside of ourselves. The tree of life is the way to transcend from the realm of action to the realm of Yetzirah, the divine creation. We transcend by formation, or yoga, the work of making our karma perfect. Formation refers here to studying the tree of life 
to align our chakras. Formation is the art of crafting one's karma. The more perfectly centered, calmly meditative, and passively flowing one's energy is, the more we say their karma is artfully crafted. The mind, distracted by disbelief, overwhelmed by doubt, and suffering from bad luck, we say such a person as this has bad karma. Karma being the combination of external chi in our aura and the kundalini spiral ascending our spines, then, like all energy fields, moves away from stasis and periodicity by nature, and, most of the time, will decay into chaos and delusions if not worked upon. Thus, the natural condition of life is, for the majority of us even today, brutish, nasty, and short. However, through yoga union with Bariya, by aligning our chakras, by studying the tree of life, through formation of a more perfect, static, and periodically regular soul, we are graduated from labor in the world of karma in Isaiah. Through formation of our souls in Yetzira, we achieve an increasingly lasting trance of Samadhi, the waking dream. The longer we sustain this trance of calmness and clear mind, the more cleansed our aura will be, and the more we will dwell in Bariah, the lost paradise and perceive all as the divine creation. The fifth title is Water. Among the many documents of our order, we find perfect understanding of the four worlds of Kabbalah according to the following model describing the cosmological creation using the three supernal elements alone to create matter, the earth element of Asaya, the lowest world. These three supernal elements are represented by the three mother letters of the Hebrew Aleph Bet. A is for air, M is for water, and S is for fire. God took fire and mixed it with air to form smoke. This we call the realm of Ayin, limitlessness, an aspect of Atsaluth, the highest world. Next, God blew the smoke with his breath, and thus mixed it with moisture, or spiritual water. The combination of all the smoke and water we call Ein Sof, or limitless nothingness, a lesser aspect of Atsaluth. Next, the stale, ashy water of the moist smoke began to descend, and the sweet water of God's first breath to ascend. As the watery aspects settle below, and the airy aspects above, bolts of lightning fire up, burning away the rest of the clear air. As these bolts of lightning warm the smoke, the water within it evaporates out as condensation. The light of Ein Sof Or, the lowest realm of the highest world, shining through this rain, refracts a seven-colored prismatic arc. Above, the cloud clears, and below, the ashes form mud in the water. From this mud, God made man. So we see now that Yetzirah, the emanations, or Sephirot, 
begin as the fiery bolts of lightning above, become the watery rainbow of air, and finally form the tree of life connecting the realm of Bariah, water of air, to Uzziah, dry earth from fire. The tree of life, therefore, is equivalent to Yetzirah, the realm above Bariah, before the fall, and below it, afterwards. The sixth title is Seven. An initiate of our order, at this degree, should now be able to understand the esoteric meaning for the seven days of creation. These are an allegory for the seven color spectrum of Asaya that comprise the seven lower emanations of Yetzira, which represent, in turn, the seven chakras of our present phase in evolution. Thus, the number seven should be remembered as referring to the way to transcend Asaya by studying Yetzirah after the fall in the form of the tree of life, and thus to align the chakras and cleanse the aura. According to the Hebrew Aleph Bet, the seven chakras, or sephirot, were equivalent to the seven visible planets of ancient stargazing. However, the dutiful student is instructed to remember the relativity between all these base seven number systems is purely a construct created by the founders of our order as a means of remembering the attributes themselves, and their base seven factor system is due only to their convenience in this in later levels, we will begin to address the grand cross alignment of these seven planets and how this relates to the seven chakras and inferior emanations on the tree of life. However, for now we do not need to remember the significance of these seven planets, only understand how to align the seven chakras by studying the seven lower sephirot on the tree of life. This concludes the knowledge lecture of the titles of 2A Degree Quarriers Guild.